Howdy, kids. Welcome to the Saturday Ask Me Anything, my live stream. We're going to be doing this every Saturday or most every Saturday. Look, I'm going to miss some Saturdays. I'm not going to lie, but we may have something else planned if that's the case. Also, um, uh, I'm Bob Harris, footballdiehards.com and the Football Diehards and Fantasy Dirt programs on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. Um, a lot going on. I'm just going to, you know, kind of kill a little time here while we wait for some people to show up and and uh, eager to have your questions. I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, way too early rankings to 2022 rankings. We did last week quarterbacks and uh, running backs. This week I'm going to jump into wide receivers and tight ends. Next week we'll maybe do uh, the overview, the overall uh, top 10 and kind of carry that over into general draft strategy, right? It's time to start thinking about that if you're me and hopefully you. Uh, a few follow-ups to some items that we have discussed in recent weeks. If you've been showing up on a regular basis, you know I've been talking some quarterbacks. Uh, some reporting this week that Aaron Rodgers wanted fifty million dollars a year and wanted to be widely named the most or widely you know viewed as the, the most highly paid quarterback in the NFL. Um, that was Diana Rossini reported that from ESPN. Aaron Rodgers, uh, Pat McAfee texted him yesterday and said, "Nah." That's not actually the case, right? So, I don't know. We'll see what goes on with Rodgers. I'm not moving. I know there's some reporting out there and a lot of chatter that that uh, Brian Gutenkunst didn't necessarily endear himself. He came out and had, did a press conference during the week, talked about keeping Devontae Adams, said we'll see how it plays out, made no firm commitments to anything because why would he? We're a week into the free agent tag window, so we're about a week away from people finding out you know, who tags, they usually carry that route right to the end. And some of Devontae Adams' future is Aaron Rodgers going to be very interested in. But also, Aaron Rodgers' future is, you know, getting him a new deal that he can, uh, a little cap-friendlier deal that can give them some cap room would be helpful in keeping Adams. So I'm sure there's a lot of talking behind the scenes that we're not hearing about. All we're hearing about is the sensational parts or the, the cleanses he's doing. Fantastic stuff he does there. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, not a lot on the QB front. Uh, some talk that Deshaun Watson, you know, the teams may be willing to uh, pursue him without resolution to the civil cases. I know the Dolphins almost had a deal for him last season. Uh, and uh, and the reason that didn't work was because he didn't want to, he couldn't get settlements with all the, uh, with all the people uh, filing civil suits against him. So I'm doing a little retweeting here. Hold on. Uh, hi, Andrea. Thanks for coming. Appreciate everyone showing up and uh, taking a little time, and uh, we'll, we'll try to make it worthwhile. Again, some of the quarterback issues. Derek Carr, still looking for a long-term contract, had some positive things to say. Kyler Murray was one that's kind of been, you know, <clears throat> rising up the radar. Uh, Cardinals uh, owner Bill Bidwell said this week that he's been in communication with Murray, who scrubbed his social media. That seems what the kids do these days, right? I'm scrubbing everyone from my social media, and, and we all sit around and – and fret, probably needlessly in most cases. Uh, Bill Bidwell says he and Kyler Murray, the team and Kyler Murray are on the same page. They need to improve. Says Cliff Kingsbury needs to improve. All these things are true. And I hope they figure out some ways to make that happen. Uh, some other little tidbits. I thought one it was interesting. Wes Welker is the wide receivers coach in Miami. Jalen Waddle coming off a phenomenal, phenomenal season. We're going to talk wide receiver rankings. He did not make it into the top 10 we're going to discuss here. But uh, there are people who are plenty high on him. He did get some votes in this. So. Um, and it was a very good year for him last year. And there's, uh, you know, Wes Welker described him as having some Tyreek Hill-like uh, abilities, right? So that's kind of encouraging. Uh, the problem with that is, you know, he may have that long speed. You know, we saw him mostly on the shorter passes, making use of his, you know, playmaking ability in the shorter and intermediate range, mostly because Tua doesn't throw that many deep balls. So they'll need to work on that a little bit and hopefully they can get a little more out of Tua. That is obviously one of their goals this season. Uh, whether two is up for it or not, we'll have to find out, right? Um, so, but interesting that they are characterizing and we're casting them in that kind of light. Um, another interesting thing, uh, the new offensive coordinator uh, in Minnesota, uh, Bum Phillips' son, uh, says, or Wade Phillips' son, Bum Phillips' grandson. Look at me. I just dated myself incredibly there. Hey, Rick, I'll get to the questions here in a moment. Um said that they maybe, you know, not going to be as run focused. They were really run heavy under Mike Zimmer. That was great 
thing for Dalvin Cook. Uh, I don't think the talk of them going, you know, less run heavy is bad news for Cook. He's still one of their vital offensive weapons, also capable of catching the football. So, uh, so yeah, don't panic too much when you read these things, but they are of interest. You know, these just these little tidbits of, you know, teams are interested. By the way, Sean McVay will be back with the Rams, despite the fact that everyone is willing to pay him a billion dollars to talk about football rather than coach it. Uh, and kudos to him for that. I would like to make those billions of dollars, but I'm not quite there. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo, there was a report this week saying he's not really a lock. Adam Schefter said that at some point. He's not a lock to be traded. Like 99% a lock to be traded. So <laughs> let's go 90, right? It's hard to, you know, don't like to get, you know, too narrow. Things are crazy in the NFL, but expect him to move on. and We'll see what, what goes on there. Uh, good morning, Timothy King. So we'll uh, start hitting some of the questions now that they're piling up and people have had a chance to arrive if they are so choosing. By the way, this is Football Die Hards uh, Weekly Ask Me Anything. I'll do this every Saturday about noon. We have plans for this. I know you keep hearing this, but they're about to come to fruition. Uh, we'll be starting to have guests. I'm going to make this a little more interactive so you can ask questions more easily, be a bigger part of the proceedings as part of our plan. So we're working in that regard. Uh, so... So hope uh, hope you'll all uh, enjoy that over the course of the off season. Guests will you know have on some of our staffers. If you haven't been to the website uh, in a few days, John Lobb has some great stuff up. Uh, started doing his Avengers Assemble Avengers. You know he he does the, the superhero thing, but his mock draft uh, and he's got a Superflex Dynasty mock draft going on a startup uh, with a number of industry insiders that do a really great job putting that together. He's got two parts of that up. Also the initial quarterback, running back, and wide receiver. Rookie reviews or his capsules for those players, his uh, rankings and assessments of those are all up in place. And I'll start working on my way too early rankings, the full set, have those up on the site pretty soon as well. Would like you to subscribe to our, our Die Hard's YouTube channel. I'm sure most of you here already are. Please hit the like button. Uh, if you like what you see today, hit the dislike button. If you don't, I hate you, Bob Harris. Um, I say that all the time. It's okay. Um, but it likes the, you know, the algorithms here at the YouTube uh, help us uh, get more eyes on us if we have more interaction. So appreciate that as well. So uh, we'll start with a couple questions before I jump into the rankings. Uh, just Dynasty, do I like ETN or Jacobs for a rebuilding team? I'd probably rather have ETN. I mean, the, the, like both of these players, you know, I, I see a spot for them on Dynasty rosters, right? <clears throat> you need a good solid volume guy. I think Kenyon Drake, whether he's back or not, we'll see. But, I mean, you're expecting kind of a passing attack. You know, you're basing this the New England coaching staff and Josh Daniels installing that offense. The running back's going to have a role in the receiving game. In the past, they've used a different – in New England, they used a different back for the receiving. Uh, they, they weren't afraid to mix it up. So maybe that's good news for Kenyon Drake and not as good news for Josh Jacobs. I think for ETN, the good news is a new coaching staff who, you know – will come in. He has a much longer jump on James Robinson, who partially tore uh, an Achilles late in the season. Maybe ETN is the only healthy guy to start the year. So I probably slightly lean to ETN in this one. Much younger player, uh, you know, an unproven offense, obviously. Um, but, you know, one that I have some higher hopes for with Doug Peterson coaching than I did with Urban Meyer. So, so I'd lean ETN in this. Uh, and I agree with you, Rick. Uh, John is fantastic. His rookie work is a phenomenal, and his ability is to communicate ideas. He will be somebody I try to drag into this very broadcast one of these weeks here very soon. Start working on that. We'll, man, well, we got some plans here, kids. Going to do some mock drafting here and maybe include some of you in those mock drafts, if at all possible, uh, as we kind of talk through and, and assess the drafts in real time. Some Some fun stuff ahead. So, again, make sure you Subscribe to the channel, hit the notification button. You don't want to miss out. And again, plan is every noon, every Saturday, unless I'm not here. And then we'll see what, it, maybe someone will jump in for me. We'll work it out. Um, so we, one of the things we wanted to get into, and the Jerry Judy dynasty value question from Timothy King kind of brings us to our first topic, and we'll get to that in a second. Boy, I don't have a lot of faith. Like, I would love to see Jerry Judy get traded, right? I mean, like, you know, maybe if the the... Broncos are looking for a quarterback and they're trying to work out a trade for somebody seeing Judy leave as part of that. And I say that not because I don't like Jerry Judy, but, but you have a young talent. He has a lot of value, number one, because he's on his rookie contract and you just signed, you know, Cortland Sutton and Tim, pa Tim Patrick is a pretty big, you know, contracts, right? So 
just last year. So they're not moving. So we'll see. I mean, I think Judy's a great player. Uh, happy birthday, Joe Herbert. I appreciate you showing up for the Underwear Olympic season. And by the way, the uh, combine is uh, is happening. There was a little bit of consternation there because the the league imposed some pretty draconian restrictions on where you could go and things. That's all been all gone away. So the combine will go on as planned initially without some of the uh, – uh, restrictions but anyhow so uh, you know for me judy is uh you know i'm uh, until denver has a quarterback it's it's hard to put a really solid value on him right because we saw last season what can happen there's they went totally run heavy they weren't passing the ball enough to make any of those guys valuable enough on any given week to sustain you know fantasy production for all three in a given week and we thought going into the season fast start for judy was hurt you know halfway through that first game so <clears throat> there's you know it's a tough situation there for me. For the, I mean, I'd be looking to buy right now, Timothy. Let's put it that way. I'd be looking to buy. I'm looking at like fantasy pros rankings. I have them up here for Dynasty. Just happened to have them up. He's like number 50 overall, right in the same range as ETN, Kyler Murray, Michael Carter. Um, you know, mostly because he's a receiver. I think he's valued a little more highly than, you know, because it's Dynasty and longer term prospects are good. So, I think that's not unreasonable. Um, and uh, But again, I'd be looking to acquire him, hoping I'm buying him on the dip a little bit because it was not a good year. And that's where we're looking to buy a lot of a lot of players, right? So let's go ahead and bring up the uh, wide receiver rankings. Uh, so if you missed it last week, we went through the uh, Sirius XM rankings. Uh, the hosts were asked to rank the top tens. And, uh, and the, all the hosts did. And uh, we went through last week, we went through running backs, at quarterbacks and running backs. And in case you missed that, running backs, pretty obvious. Number one, Jonathan Taylor, Derrick Henry, two. Uh, what did I have? Let me bring that up. Austin Eckler, Dalvin Cook, Najee Harris, five. Joe Mixon, six. Christian McCaffrey, seven. Javante Williams, eight. Alvin Kamara, nine. Nick Chubb, ten. If you want to go to the footballdiehards.com website, that uh, chat is up. Also, with the quarterbacks, number one, Josh Allen, two, Patrick Mahomes, three, Justin Herbert, four, Lamar Jackson, five, Joe Burrow, six, Kyler Murray, seven, Aaron Rodgers, eight, Dak Prescott, nine, Matthew Stafford, and 10, Jalen Hurts. So if you missed that chat and you wanted to go catch up on it, go to footballdiehards.com. We have it in the middle of the page or in the upper left-hand corner of the page. There's a link to that that may get replaced. But in the middle of the page, we'll, you'll see uh, video content, and I'll have some links to uh, recent uh, ask me anything. These are the live streams that we've done, and you can find that where we discuss those tie, those quarterbacks and running backs. Now we're going to talk about the wide receivers. I don't think there's a ton of surprises here. Look, Cooper Cup. I know what you're all. I, I hear you all. He's going to be regression. Yes, and even if with regression, he would still be phenomenal, right? So he was. It was a remarkable season, and nobody should be drafting him, expecting that kind of season, even though clearly it's within his range of possible outcomes. Hard to imagine him playing at that rate. So this is a Sirius XM ranking. So I used the scoring system that the, from the leagues we played in at Sirius last season to look at the scoring totals for these players. Uh, Cooper Cup was the highest scoring player by far. And it's not a, you know, it's just a standard PPR scoring system, right? Six points for touchdowns. Just so a very normal scoring system, generic. Cooper Cup had 405 points. The next highest score was Josh Allen. So he has 362. He outscored the best scoring quarterback by 40 points. So it was a huge year, right? And expecting that to continue would be a reach. But also expecting him to play at a supremely high level, Sean McVay is back again. Uh, that helps. He's lost some assistant coaches. I don't think that hurts. McVay runs the offense. Uh, the pieces around him, uh, in particular Matthew Stafford, isn't going anywhere. We'll see if Odell Beckham, you know, don't expect him back early in the season, but Robert Woods coming back early in the season is more than reasonable. Van Jefferson still being there. So I don't see, like, I don't see any substantial changes. Here's the thing. 25 points per game. That was his average this year. That's a huge average. We'll knock off 25 points a week off that. That's still 20 points a game. Let me look at the scoring system and see how many other wide receivers were in that range. The next scoring high wide receiver was at 21 points per game. That was Devontae Adams who comes in at number two. Uh, <clears throat> these are my also my top two. 
Uh, I'm going to be pretty close on the top four. In fact, I'm dead on the top four. Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson round out the top four. I have them in that order. I think the votes were pretty mixed on them. You could find people who are a little higher on Jefferson. Uh, I think for dynasty purposes, and I know a lot of you are interested in dynasty this time of year, and that's very understandable. I know I am. The big question here, you know, is that three and four, do you prefer Chase or do you prefer Jefferson? They're both amazing players. Both have long futures ahead of them. I mean, they're both young enough that we can kind of throw age out the window. But if you're splitting hairs and these guys have that level of talent, sure, it's a little younger for Jamar Chase. And so, you know, a little less wear and tear. He took a year off in college too. Um, Also, though, you know who his quarterback's going to be for how long now, right? At least the next five years, I would think is safe to say. Uh, Four years, almost certainly, barring injury. I mean, he's going to continue playing with Joe Burrow. Justin Jefferson, it's a little less clear, right? I mean, there's already talk, you know, whether the Vikings will try to move on from or teams will be make a push to acquire uh, Kirk Cousins. Uh, I think he'll stay in Minnesota probably this year, maybe beyond. So I think it's pretty much a wash. But again, if you're splitting hairs on these guys, which you have to do, if you're looking at them from a dynasty perspective, having that certainty of quarterback over the coming years and knowing that connection is already strong and expecting that it grows. I mean, if he could... If he could uh, put a little more consistency on his week-to-week totals, wouldn't that be phenomenal? And, you know, maybe he never gets there to that high end. You know, uh, we're going to talk about some boom-bust type plays. I don't think Jamar Chase is necessarily a boom-bust type play, but I think the totals were, you know, across the board. He was, by the way, the fifth highest scorer in this uh, scoring point average. You talk about the boom-bust. His low game was eight points, I think six points. Uh, he had over one point. He had a one-point game in week 15. So he had a miserable week in week 15. But for the most part, he was, you know, he was well up there. His average scoring on the season was 18 points a game. Pretty solid. Justin Jefferson was also at 18 points. So about a tenth of a, or no, let's see. Chase was 18. Jefferson was also 18 points per game. So had a little higher total, but played more games uh, than the next man, Debo Samuel. We'll talk about all these guys. Um, So... So for me, Cooper Cup, easy number one. Not even a conversation. Devontae Adams, it's a conversation only because the you need him to remain in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, I think, for this value to hold up. Look, Devontae Adams is going to be good wherever he plays, whoever he's playing with. But is he going to be at the level he's at now, not playing with Aaron Rodgers? I think that would be a, that'd be a stretch, right, at saying the least. Also, Expecting him to have a better season, he ended up a 21.7 points per game average, scored 326 points in this scoring system. Uh, it was a phenomenal season, right? But what was missing were the touchdowns that we saw a lot the previous year. He had 17 touchdowns this year. He did not. So uh, it, it seemed to me coming into the season, one of the things you could make an argument for Devontae Adams drafting him early, and I, I did draft him early and often. And I got some value on him in a number of points because of that uncertainty of Aaron Rodgers heading you know, post-draft after he – we got all the uncertainty. People started buying out. But he never dipped Devontae Adams below the middle of the second round in drafts I was in. But still, that's a significant value. And that's going to be the conversation this year. You know, I think we'll get earlier resolution. He'll either get franchised and we'll know Aaron Rodgers is coming back uh, by the time that happens. I mean, because, you know, we're, they're, we're going to have resolution pretty soon on Aaron Rodgers, uh, at least according to Aaron Rodgers. So assuming they're all locked in and everyone comes back, Devontae Adams at number two is perfectly reasonable. We'll see what happens if that's not how it's playing out and how much value that uncertainty creates. I will still be looking to buy. I'm going to be interested in Devontae Adams wherever he plays and whoever he plays with. If it was Las Vegas and he played with Derek Carr, his college quarterback, there would be something to say for that. It would certainly upgrade the Raiders' offense. And, and look, Carr has, has, some chem- has shown some chemistry with him as well because they've worked together. So that would be interesting, and it's definitely a need there. But obviously, that's not my expectation. My expectation right now, uh, as we talked about last week, I'm like 90% that Aaron Rodgers is either a Packer or retired. That other 10% is out there, right? Some you know, strange things have happened. I mean, there's a lot of people trying to talk about Brian Gutenkun's statement this week saying that he never promised to trade Aaron Rodgers as something that will suddenly create a wedge. I'm not sure I believe that, right? I'm just we hear so much stuff about the, these situations that ends up being totally 100 percent not true, right? So <clears throat> I'm gonna try and keep the uh keep the emotion and excitement dialed back a little bit on this one until we have some resolution, because I think it'll come early. 
Assuming that it does come, though, and it is Devontae Adams remaining in Green Bay, or we have a pretty good reason to believe he will remain in Green Bay, franchise tag, um, then I'm cup one, Adams two is locked in. I'm locked in on Chase three and Jefferson four. I think you could make arguments for either of those guys being ahead of the other, being Chase and Jefferson. I'm fine with that. Here's where it gets tricky for me. Debo Samuel is at five, uh, and and I have some, you know, there were some ancillary numbers out there, like the number of people who voted. I think Debo Samuel had a vote at number two overall, number two overall, right? So clearly he was up there number one uh, in somebody's book. Somebody voted him number one. So that's worth noting. I mean, people, my faith in Debo is not as great. I have Debo at number seven. We'll talk about the guys I have in between there. Uh, well, let's talk about them now. They're the two guys after him in these rankings, the six and seven. I have Tyreek Hill at five. I have Dix at six, and I have Debo Samuel at seven. So Samuel, I get it. You know, it was it was a phenomenal season. I'm very impressed with what he did. The question is, is that kind of workload sustainable for him? I think that's always a question for you know, anytime someone comes up with a kind of a unique role. Do I think that that Kyle Shanahan is capable of uh, of coming up, c- continue to use him in creative ways, and Debo Samuel is c- capable of making those kind of plays? Certainly. Certainly possible. Does it seem likely to me? I don't know if I want to say likely, right? That's the problem. Uh, just looking at the numbers here, I wanted to bring them up just so I had them in front of me. Had 121 targets. That's fantastic. 77 catches. That's fantastic. Six touchdowns. Incredibly solid. But the difference making came as a rusher. He had 59 carries, 365 yards. He had eight rushing touchdowns. I think the question for me is whether you believe or I believe that's sustainable, right? That kind of uh, scoring off that number of carries, uh, you know, I mean, just anytime you have an outlier season, like I would say the same with Cordero Patterson in Atlanta, right? I mean, it was a phenomenal season for him, both as a rusher and receiver. They found the unique ways to use him. Do I have 100% confidence that, that, number one, they'll continue to use him in that way, or maybe they'll find some different personnel combinations or come up with some different schemes? That seems like one of the possibilities. Number two, uh, you know, as I'm sitting here talking, some of their defensive coordinators in the NFL will study film of Debo Samuel and trying to figure, and Cordero Patterson, by the way, trying to figure out, these guys don't take the time off. They're trying to figure out ways to stop this and com- combat what were very effective approaches. Uh, and so, you know, there'll be scheme, there'll be people scheming up against this. So I just think the five and certainly like whoever voted him and, and I don't know the votes and and I didn't see the, I do know he had not one number one vote. So I think that's, you know, that to me is getting a little aggressive. I mean, I like Debo and, and I, but I think Brandon Iooks can be a factor. George Kittle can be a factor. By the way, there's going to be a new quarterback there. It seems so some concerns for me, Tyreek Hill. I get it. He's a little boom bust, you know, as I mentioned, just looking at his totals uh, last year in this score, he says some 36 points, 5 points, 9 points, 47 points, 14 points, 22 points, 11 points, 27 points, 7 points, 27 points, 19 points, 4 points, 11 points, 32 points. He was all over the map, right? And that, But that's that's kind of baked in with, with Tyreek Hill, I think. You know you're going to have those huge games, and you know you're going to have some some outliers, some quiet games. And, it, you know, it's the, the hope is he can – come up with more of those big games than those quiet games. He had a little quiet streak. So did Travis Kelsey, by the way, and they both bounced back. So I think, you know, six is not crazy. Again, I have him at five. I have Diggs at at six. I think Diggs season is interesting in that, you know, there were, the you know, Josh Allen was looking some different directions, but it wasn't a horrible season, right? I mean, it feels like we have this impression that, uh, Stephon Diggs came up way short. Well, he came up a little short. I mean, you know, we had maybe uh, maybe our expectations weren't realistic in terms of uh, uh, of totals, whatever. But I mean, so his, his catch total went down twenty four catches. He went from one hundred twenty seven to to one hundred three catches. The targets are what interests me. He's had one hundred sixty six last year. He still had one hundred sixty four targets this year. He had ten touchdowns this year. He increased that total from eight. So, I mean, I think this is still a super solid play, especially in offense. I mean, granted, we're losing an offensive coordinator. I, we talked about this last week with Josh Allen. I think Ken Dorsey is plenty capable. He's a guy that Josh Allen endorsed, former quarterback, smart guy, smart enough to know that Stephon Diggs needs to be a big part of this offense. 
So I'm totally on board with that. And I, I see a question, JR1616. I'll get to you on, the, on that as well. Um, I'll work through this top 10. And then we'll talk about some of the outliers and some of the guys that are pressing up against these rankings, I think. Uh, A.J. Brown. Uh, you know, so, so A.J. Brown's a very good player. I have him at number 10. I have C.D. Lamb at 8, DeAndre Hopkins at 9, and Brown at, at 10. And I guess the problem here... Uh, I don't think C. I think C.D. Lamb should be number eight, as I said, Scott, just now. Um, I think some of that is I'm, you know, being a little assertive just because I think there's going to be some more targets. We, we don't know what that receiving core is going to look like. I'll get to that. Let me finish on Brown. Um, look, we, we know what Brown is capable of, right? I mean, he can be super good, but it's been hit or miss with him. And obviously, you know, the desire there is to be run heavy. They're going to try and go run first. And that makes perfect sense to me as long as – as uh, Derrick Henry is healthy, we know that's going to be the focal point of the offense, the rushing attack. And, uh, you know, I think Brown is plenty good. He's plenty athletic. He does great things. There are just weeks where he doesn't show up as well. I'm looking for him in this. I think he missed enough games. He's going to be outside the top 30 on this. Just bring up his week to week. Top 64. Bear with me. Thank you. Uh, so, so he was down. He to wide receiver 34, but there were missed games, right? So that's the thing. His average scoring, though, is a 13.16. I mean, that's the problem for me. And there were big weeks in there. Yes, they had 20, 31 points, 31 points twice. But there were some total duds in there. And I think you get that kind of boom bust. Uh, volatility with him and it worries me a little bit and then primarily it worries me because of what the desire of this offense is is to be run heavy so i think that's my concern with brown i'm not as aggressive on him i still have him at number 10 hope he can stay healthy all year i think he'll be super good dk metcalf i do not have in my top 10 he would be right outside i think there's a reasonable argument bounce back season for russell wilson i'll get to that i see scott's asking a question about that uh I, you know Number one, I don't think Russell Wilson gets traded. Number two, I don't think DK gets traded either. But that's me. If we want to sit here and speculate if these things did happen, you know, <laughs> he is, uh, what, He's uh, he's got still two years left on his contract, right? So... So there's that. He's uh, he, And that's what would make him of interest for teams looking to acquire him. I don't know that the Seahawks are looking to get rid of him for the same reason, right? He's on a rookie contract. The thing I think about Russell Wilson, if he does get traded, it would probably be to a team that has a quarterback. You hear Philadelphia and the Giants mentioned whether that's on his list or not. But you would think they would get a quarterback back. And if they do, whether it was Hurts or Daniel Jones, I mean, I think whoever it is would be able to get the ball to DK Metcalf. Would he be as high end? No. And that's why I don't have him in my top 10. Just uh, enough uncertainty. He's right outside it. So, um, <clears throat> you know. I mean, I get this is a, this is funny season where we like to think a lot of things are going to happen. I think that's and, and they're all like, look, I'm not by any means saying nothing is possible. Everything is possible. I just think the odds are <clears throat> when the 2022 season starts, Russell Wilson, and DK Metcalf are going to be playing in Seattle. And if that's the case, I'll be a little more interested in DK Metcalf than I am now. Uh, on Lamb, I have him at number eight. He's number ten here. I think there's questions about CD, uh, about Amari Cooper's future, but more specifically, you know, Michael Gallup did not undergo his surgery until just like the 10th of February, expecting him to be ready for the start of the season seems like a reach. I know, you know, Cedric Wilson played pretty well, and uh, so I get it. That, that doesn't seem to be much of a drop off. Dalton Schultz is a unrestricted free agent. I don't think he'll be back. Uh, so, Either way, I mean, clearly they're soured on Amari Cooper. If you've heard the comments from Jerry and Stephen Jones, none of them have been glowing, right? They need more from him. There's similar comments to what we've heard about Carson Wentz. Well, maybe not that strident, right? Uh, but definitely some disappointment in Amari Cooper. One of the things I hear from people who cover the team on a daily basis, including Michael Gelkin and others uh, from the Dallas Morning News and others, is that, you know, he's not kind of like, you know, we think of these number one wide receivers. I'm speaking of Cooper here as kind of these alphas demanding the ball, etc. He's not really that guy. I don't know if that makes a difference. CeeDee Lamb seems more like that guy. I would I would prefer Lamb on my roster to any of the other Cowboys. And I think expecting a little improvement in that offense is not a reach either. 
just in general. And some of that's going to come, I think, because Dak Prescott's going to be more willing to run. I think that because it's just a year removed from the injury now. And uh, <clears throat> and we just didn't see it that much last year. I think it's a big part of their offense when he's when he's running well. And they need to get that dialed back in. Uh, so there we have the top 10. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins is the only guy that I talked about that isn't mentioned in this group. And I get it, right? The targets were down for him even before he was hurt. And it seems like... For me, watching the Cardinals play, it's an indication of what looks to me like Carl Kyler Murray evolving as a passer, right? And earlier in his career, he was looking for one guy because that one guy was DeAndre Hopkins and he was really good. So he had these huge target totals for Hopkins that were that were phenomenal. Last year he spread it out a little more. And I mean, and and not not just because Hopkins was hurt, but because he was spreading it out more. If you look in the early in the season, the numbers weren't Phenomenal. I think we had 64 total targets this year in 10 games. That's six targets a game. Go back to previous years, 160, 150, 160. I mean, DeAndre Hopkins was pretty much the uh, primary game. So a little bit spreading around. We'll see there's guys that are that are free agents there, right? So, you know, Christian Kirk, we're going to have to see where he ends up, et cetera. But expecting DeAndre Hopkins to come back and take the lead role, I don't think is crazy. And I think in PPR formats, it's pretty reasonable. <clears throat> T Higgins and Keenan Allen are two guys outside the top 10 that can reach the top 10. What guys do you think could get there? I, I think those are, those are prime examples. And JR 1616 asked about that. I think Keenan Allen for me is pushing right up against that. Uh, and, and the thing I like about Higgins, right. And so okay, just to, to, in this scoring system, Keenan Allen finished, you know, ninth overall. One of the names that we're not mentioning here, who's been a mortal lock, to be a top 10 in PPRs is Deontay Johnson. Uh, the target shares have been huge, but also there's changes at quarterback. And so that's a big concern for him, I think. Another guy that I think could push up in there, I think Jalen Waddell, Mike Evans, if Chris Godwin is healthy, all those guys are going to be in the conversation. Um, but for me, Waddell is the guy to watch. I mean, I just, you know, you look at how they used him last season. You see this coaching staff coming in, the use they made of Devo Samuel this year. I wouldn't expect a you know, 60 carries this year for even for Samuel, let alone uh, Jalen Waddle. But clearly he's got some next level playmaking ability. And I would look for the uh, I would look for the Dolphins to fully utilize that. So I do like uh, Jalen Waddle as one of those guys who can make that push. I think Mike Evans, you can make an argument every year should be in the top 10 or could be in the top 10. But again, quarterback questions. And I think for a lot of these receivers that we aren't talking about right now, that's some of the issue. Uh, T Higgins to me is a guy. So Dempsey and I, Mike Dempsey on uh, my co-host on football diehards, we did our first mock draft and it's a really good point. If you, if you're, if you're doing your draft and you're looking in, you know, in the first round, you have to draft, uh, you know, if you wanted to get Jamar Chase, you have to pretty much draft him in the first round. I think that's a safe bet. Well, if you do that, what do you get coming back? I think, you know, the draft we did, the first mock draft we did, uh, Dempsey took Jefferson in round one. It was the 10th pick overall. Came back, got Javante Williams, came back in round three, got Ezekiel Elliott. Who did he get in round four? T. Higgins. And I think that's the thing for Higgins. Here's a guy that could push against the top 10, right? Or certainly even be in the top 10. Uh, and and you get him, so, I mean, you're getting him three rounds of value over a Jamar Chase, right? I think that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Those are the kind of plays I'm always looking for. I'm not afraid to take the cheaper component uh, and reap that value. I mean, you're not getting the same high end, but on a week-to-week -week basis, any given week, you're going to get some pretty good upside with T. Higgins. So I think that's reasonable. In this scoring system, Higgins just finished this last season as, uh, what was it? It's pretty damn high. Uh, wide receiver 19, 15 points per game, missed a couple games early in the season. So there's that. So, um, last one of the receivers from me, do you see while taking on a deep like role? Yeah, I think to a degree, but whether they do it as a runner or as a receiver, just more short passes, maybe the thing. Cause that plays into two as hands for JR 16, 16, also on Gabriel Davis, expecting more from him this season. Uh, talk to Sal Capaccio covers the bills. Um, on a weekly basis on the Football Diehards program uh, this past week. And he thinks a much bigger role for Davis coming. He feels like Cole Beasley will be probably a cap casualty at this point and move on. And that doesn't seem unreasonable either. 
Uh, so, so yeah, I, I do think Gabriel Davis will come on and, and play a more prominent role in this passing attack. And I think he's a solid play. Uh, won't have to pay the kind of, you know, price you're paying for Stefan Diggs. This may be one of the things where you take the, the cheaper option, right? <clears throat> and uh, let me just look at the early rankings. Uh, here on Fantasy Pros, just kind of the consensus rankings. I think you'll see where they have B. Davis at. I think it's viewing him as a wide receiver three type, and that's right where he is, 36, tail end of the wide receiver threes. I can make arguments for him ahead of some of the other guys. Mike Williams is an interesting player. Amon Ross St. Brown is higher than him. Don't know that I would have him necessarily higher than Gabriel Davis. I thought it was a great rookie season, right? I'm not taking anything away from him. Just wondering if he can replicate that uh, role in the need. They're going to find some other receiving talent somewhere, whether it's in free agency or in the draft in Detroit. And will he have the same role? And TJ Hawkinson will maybe be healthier, hopefully. And we'll talk about him here momentarily. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think Davis is a great play and a good cheap, cheaper option, right? And uh, if you're wanting to invest in that Bills offense. So there you have it. Cooper Cup, Devontae Adams, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Debo Samuel, Tyreek Hill, Stephon Diggs, A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf, C.D. Lamb. Those are the station rankings. My rankings differ slightly. I had Cup, Adams, Chase, and Jefferson as my top four. Uh, Debo fell down to seven for me with uh, Hill and Diggs at five and six. I like C.D. Lamb at number eight. DeAndre Hopkins at nine. A.J. Brown at ten. So let's take a look at the tight ends. And some interesting, for me, thoughts on tight end in general, right? We always say the same thing every year. You either invest and get one of the early tight ends or you punt. I'm rethinking that notion, right? Punting, you know, if you're not the only one punting and there's a group of people punting, you're all chasing the same streaming options. And uh, while there's a lot of tight ends out there, uh, they're maybe not as viable is the guys I'd rather have. I think this top 10 isn't bad. I think there's some guys at the tail end of this that I'm not as keen on. We'll talk about those. But to start with, uh, I think the the first point is Travis Kelsey. He's getting older, people. Uh, clearly, uh, everyone knows this. But when does he drop off? Is he at the point where he's dropping off? We saw some poor games last year. Uh, he failed to show up in some late season games when we needed him the most. But in the end, he's still got 92 passes. He's got at least 90 passes in each of the last five years. This year was his lowest of those totals in those five years, 103, 97, 105, 92. Had nine touchdowns compared to 11 last season. He had five the year before uh, and 10 the year before that. So he also had like 80, 85, 72, 67. It's been super solid. I still think he's got another season in him. If you don't, I think there, you know, it's certainly – Plenty fair to go with one of these other options, right? I wouldn't have a complaint about that at all. I love Mark Andrews. Uh, I don't know if I'll be getting him as much this year. going to have to pay a second round price tag for him probably. Travis Kelsey is probably going to fall out of the first round, something we've seen the last couple of years, depending on who you're drafting with. I bet if you draft with Sigmund Bloom, you're still taking him to the first round. Probably with Mike Dempsey, it's going to be very close. In fact, what did he take him? He did have him in this mock draft. Took him, took Kamara 12 and Kelsey uh with the next pick so basically the first pick of round two uh and we'll be doing more mock drafts if you'd like to tune into the football diehards program on sirius xm fantasy sports radio uh monday nights will be a mock draft night we'll either Dempsey and i will be doing it together or with uh with with bringing in guests and we'll do some here too uh so Mark Andrews, I don't think anyone's going to argue that he should not be number two. They use him more as a wide receiver. He was going deep. He was doing phenomenal work last year. Got targeted regardless of the quarterback. And I think expecting, you know, maybe even more heavily when it wasn't Lamar Jackson. But still, it's going to be heavily targeted. Going to be a huge factor in this offense. It's the reason they paid him all the money. Uh, I'll get to Renfro Mooney. Don't worry about it, Jar. I'll get to it uh, before we get out of here. Um, and so, uh, love Andrews. I mean, I just think the price is going to be a little high. The next, where it gets interesting is, and where I start deviating a little bit, I have Waller ahead of Kittle. Uh, I have Pitts ahead of Kittle. So I have Kittle at five. 
I don't know that, you know, look, I have no problem having him at number three, right? It's not like he's horrible. It's not like the change of quarterback is going to be devastating for him, although it presents a level of uncertainty, right, uh, that I'm not sure I want to deal with. He tends to miss a few games here and there. only missed two this past season. Uh, still caught 71 passes. But there are weeks where he just doesn't show up, right? There are weeks where they're more run heavy and he's just a blocker. You wonder if some of the passes he did get aren't going to be turned into runs with, uh, with uh, if Trey Lance takes over. I'm assuming that to be the case. I feel a little bit like we're chasing some of his bigger seasons in 2018 and 2019. Uh, still scored six touchdowns last year, so I still like him an awful lot. I just don't have him up there. I just see more of Waller rebounding, uh, number one. Again, I talked about it a little earlier on the wide receivers. Uh, but if you look, and we'll talk about this with Renfro too, JR. Um, if you're looking at it, uh, it uh, what the, the Patriots have done in the past, they make pretty good use of the tight ends, right? He's still their best weapon at the position. Uh, still had 55 catches in 11 games, 93 targets over the course of that span. 145 targets a year before, though, was phenomenal. Uh, turned it into 107 catches. Could I see him rising back up into that range again? Yes, and, and he had nine touchdowns, and that was a big deal. I could see him rising up in that regard as well. So I like Waller a little bit better than the consensus here. Uh, and, and I get it. If you don't, if you're a little concerned, I think Derek Carr staying their quarterback works in his favor. So uh, Kyle Pitts is at number five. So my top five is Kelsey, Andrews, Waller, Pitts, and Kittle. So same guys, different order. Kyle Pitts, why? Why am I a little higher? Uh, it's the one touchdown. I think some positive regression is coming here, right? If Kyle Pitts had had six touchdowns last year, we'd be having an entirely different conversation about him, right? I think that's a, that's a safe bet. Was still very busy, right? 110 targets, 68 catches, 1,026 yards. The one touchdown was a limiting factor. What else were limiting factors for him is the fact that they didn't have anybody else, right? He was the guy who was drawing the primary coverage. He was getting the wide receiver one coverage uh, for a good portion of the season, certainly after Cotton. Calvin Ridley was gone. We don't know if Calvin Ridley will be back, but they'll certainly have a plan in place that will improve their receiving course to some degree. And uh, and I think expecting Kyle Pitts to progress in his second season. Look, we were all there was we were all over the place uh, on you know on Kyle Pitts last year. A lot of people very skeptical of whether he's capable of whether any rookie tight end could you know be a true top ten tight end. Well, he was still a top ten tight end even though he only scored one touchdown. I'm expecting more from him this year. And I feel a little more comfortable about that, knowing Matt Ryan is the plan for now. Uh, Scott Kobe wants to know, how far down do you feel comfortable drafting a tight end? And I think Waller has a huge year with me Daniels there. I agree with that. And uh, and I think Andrea also agrees with that. That And that's why I have him ranked, uh, where I have him ranked at number three, right? I just think there's, uh, there's ample reason to believe that in that offense – We'll make heavy that offense with Josh McDaniels calling the plays. will make great use of the tight end. Seems entirely likely. Um, and, and also, JR on Renfro as well, right? And I, I would have Renfro ahead of, ahead of Mooney. Uh, you wonder what the Bears' plan at wide receiver is. Is Mooney a true wide receiver one? I don't know. Renfro is not a true wide receiver one, but he's got that kind of slot. Uh, role that McDaniels has favored in New England has favored. So I like the usage there. So I think this was a good thing for uh, Waller, Renfro, and maybe a good thing for like a player like Kenyon Drake, a, a complimentary receiving type of back, uh, something that the Patriots have relied on. And that's not to say Josh McDaniels is going to New England, to Las Vegas and totally replicate what he did uh, in New England, but yes, he's going to replicate it to some degree, right? He's going to run an offense similar to what he ran, I think is a safe bet. So yes, I'm, I'm in on all those guys and I'm a, a little, so in PPR, definitely I'm fine with Renfro. I think Mooney was great last year. Um, I wonder how sustainable that is, but is certainly, I, look, I, I would expect the Bears to move on from Allen Robinson and that leaves Mooney basically, basically as the de facto wide receiver one there. So not against taking a chance on him either, and I don't know how big of a chance it would actually be if you want to call it taking a chance. Finished last year a little bit lower than I like. The, the, I need to see some things from the Bears. Like I like some of the moves they made this offseason, but some of those moves still haven't played out, and that's going to be upgrading the offensive line. We know you can do that quickly. We saw teams do it, the Chiefs, the Chargers, 
uh, both done it. You can do it in pretty short order if you're aggressive in free agency, but the Bengals are also going to be out there looking to do that as well. So uh, I'll believe it when I see it. I need to see more Bears. Um, all right. So then the second half of that top five, I also think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, get it to one of the top guys or punt. Well, I think the guys that I'm going to consider the top guys is going to extend a little further. And it is going to include TJ Hawkinson, Dallas Goddard. I think those are guys that should be in there. I'm going to include Dox and Knox in there as well. I have Knox a little higher. I have him at number six. I have Hawkinson at number seven. I have Goddard at number eight. I have Schultz also at number nine. Um, but some of that's going to depend. I think his value is going to depend on his landing spot. If he stays in Dallas, that would be ideal. Maybe he could actually be a value if he stays in Dallas at this cost. And Pat Fryermuth, I'm a little concerned about just the quarterback situation. He looked very good last year for a rookie, obviously. I'm going to go with Logan Thomas there right now. I think he's going to be recovered, or he has a better chance of being recovered and ready for the start of the season. But that kind of tells you how thin it is when we're looking at number 10, some of the disparity here. I have Logan Thomas, a guy coming off a torn ACL, and didn't finish and missed a fair amount of the season due to injuries, not including the ACL. So Pat Fryermuth, I have big concerns at quarterback. Maybe the, you know, maybe a diminished uh, passer or a lesser passer or a lesser commodity at quarterback works in his favor as a security blanket. I'll have to see how that plays out. Maybe I'm more in on this as we go forward. But for now, I'm not as in on Fryermuth. I think at tight end, some of the guys that we're looking at that, you know, to make a jump, I wanted to bring up my list of that. Oh, Mike Kosecki is a guy that we didn't talk about here. I think, you know, we've seen what Mike McDaniels with the 49ers. Mike McDaniels comes from San Francisco, in case you missed that at some point. So running a Kyle Shanahan type offense, Mike Kosecki, uh, you know, is an unrestricted free agent. Uh, talking recently to people who cover the team on a daily basis, the expectation is he stays, uh, whether it's both he and they hang on to Devontae Parker. All those pieces stay in place is unclear. Um, <clears throat> But I think Gusecki's a good argument. I see Scott Kobe likes Cole Komet. We'll see how the offense works out. I mean, I think he I think he was better. He certainly showed some progress last year. I uh, wasn't entirely impressed with the overall results, but he came on stronger down the stretch. So fair enough there. He averaged six points a game uh, total. He'll need to do a lot better than that. Entirely possibly we will. I'm not a big, you know, I'm a big advocate of not drafting last year's best team and drafting this year's best team. Uh, I just haven't seen enough. And talking to people who cover the Bears on a daily basis, you know, that's somebody I pressed on to see if, you know, they expected more. Uh, and they're a little they're a little skeptical as well. Uh, so the, uh, one of the names that, you know, I don't want to overlook here is uh, Irv Smith Jr. Was injured early this season. We all had high hopes from him. Kind of was probably down to just outside the top 10 for a lot of people last season. Uh, that offense is a pretty good funnel, goes through just a narrow band of guys, and I think we thought he would add to that. If he's healthy again in Minnesota, maybe he can. Again, a Rams-type offense. We saw Tyler Higby come on down the stretch. Higby is another player. Maybe we see him in this range here as well. I think that's not unreasonable. Uh, talking about some of the guys that are here, I like Dawson Knox ahead of uh, Hawkinson and Goddard. Look, Hawkinson is fantastic, right? He was a little hit or miss last year. I think you could attribute some of that to just a horrible offense or just a horrible team. Uh, he really slowed down there due to, and I think partially due to injury uh, early in the season, then came on a little strong and then got hurt again. So, um, you know, expecting him to be in this range isn't out, outside the realm of possibility, but I think Dawson Knox is a player that's kind of overlooked in this ranking. I have him firmly ahead of Hawkinson Goddard. Assuming the quarterback situation stays the same in Philadelphia, which I think it will, Dallas Goddard should get a hell of a lot of targets. They just need to upgrade their receiving core there, and we'll, it remains to be seen how they'll do that. And until they do, I think the, you know expecting Goddard to get a good target share isn't a reach. So those are some of the guys. Throw out some other names there if you're interested in them. I know there's like Noah Fant is a name that I have not touched on. Zach Ertz was phenomenal in Arizona. I think you could make an argument for him being in that range of streaming options, C.J. Uzama seemed to come on a little bit. We'll see what happens in Los Angeles. There's going to be tight end there that's good. They don't have any under contract, I don't think. Uh, I think Steven Andrews is the, or Steven Anderson is the only guy under contract still. So they could bring Jared Cook back, but it wasn't a great year for him. Gerald Everett struggled a bit. Uh, the Browns, David Njoku, sounds like he'll come back, but they're, they have a problem there, and it's a big problem that, from a fantasy perspective when you have – 
three tight ends and they have Austin Hooper, who they invest a lot of money in and Joku who kind of wanted to work his way out of there last season, but never made it. And now seems to be happy there. And Harrison Bryant is also there and they're a tight end heavy offense, but they, when they use all three, it kind of dilutes all of them. Um, and I, you know, one thing working commits favor, Scott, I'll say this is, you know, Jimmy Graham is a non-factor that offense just needs to progress a little bit. And until I see that I'm going to remain skeptical. The name we haven't mentioned, or another name we haven't mentioned, Rob Gronkowski. What does he do? Uh, JR sixteen sixteen. After top five, I'd wait. I've seen Knox fall. I'd buy that. Ertz, Fant, Henry, the waiver wire. Yeah, you know Henry was so touchdown dependent last year, yet he still scored the touchdowns. Does Jonu Smith play a bigger role this year? Does he emerge as the? They paid both those guys a lot of money, and they went after Smith before they went after Henry. So I mean, does that portend a greater role for Smith, or does he just slow to pick up the? The take, uh, but yeah, I think all those guys are reasonable. Uh, Pitts might be my Andrews in this year's draft if I don't want to invest in Andrews. And it is a steep price. This is second round price. I think it's fair, low end, back end of the second round. I don't think it's too high a price. But if I'm looking to shore up, or if I see a running back or some wide receiver value there, it really appeals to me. Um, <clears throat> I could see passing, and Pitts would be the guy I targeted. I think I got him in this mock draft. Uh, yeah, I got him at seven, uh, seventh pick of the third round, uh, which I didn't think was too bad. I started that team out with Devonte Adams, came back around, got DeAndre Swift, then got Kyle Pitt. So not too bad. So yeah, I think, and so next week I'm going to come back and we're going to do overall, the overall serious overall rankings, top 10. And I'll go a little beyond that, but I think that kind of sets the conversation for overall draft strategy this year. When should quarterbacks start going? Are we dialing back on that a little bit? How many running backs are going to go in the first round? Wide receivers are gaining steam. A lot of people, uh, you know, are kind of going to be a little more assertive on wide receivers, thinking there's maybe less downside than there is with running backs, where we see, you know, anybody who invested in, you know, certainly Christian McCaffrey last year is going to be going, I, I'd like to rethink this, right? And maybe even Derrick Henry, although, you know, both guys were phenomenal as long as they're on the field. You know, I'm injury agnostic. I try not to get too caught up in the injuries because anyone can get hurt. But, you know, when it becomes a repetitive pattern, uh, it can get very frustrating. For me, that's when I start looking for value. For other people, it's when they try to stay away. That's why I get the value. So I understand that dynamic. And if you're, you look, and there's arguments on either side of it, right? I, you know, if you went in on McCaffrey for a second year in a row, thinking you're getting great, great value, uh, yeah, Camara, right, late in round three. In this in this first mock I did with Dempsey Scott, it was a uh, he was the end of the first round. And I thought, wow, that's not that's not a, that's some value too, um, compared to where he'd been going. And expecting him to be a major part of this Saints offense does not seem like a reach, right? <clears throat> no matter what, whether he's working as a receiver or clearly they're not afraid to hand him the football either. So some interesting uh, thing. We got to see what the quarterback situation is there. Uh, before how we view them. But I think the late round, I think that is a total steal. Great, great pick there. I know you were drafting that weekend when last weekend when we were having this discussion. Um, I like, you know, so uh, on the list that JR put out there, you know, I think, you know, Fant is interesting. And Ertz might be the most interesting there. And if Knox falls, yeah, absolutely. I'm all in on that. Again, I have him at number number six. So, Certainly, and I think, you know, his chemistry with uh, with Josh Allen is only building. Remember, he was a little bit of a raw prospect. I don't want to say a raw prospect, but he didn't have a ton of production in college. People were kind of in- interested in him in the draft. I know the Patriots were one of those that started talking about just based on a great combine performance. He didn't have a ton of production uh, in college. So maybe uh, needed some time to develop him. I think we're seeing it. Could that come to fruition? So I'm with you there. If he falls, I'm all in. Ertz as well. Fant, I'm more interested in seeing how the quarterback situation plays out before I invest, but obviously he's very good. But they also have another tight end there uh, in Alberto who's capable as well. And so I'm a little con- concerned. Earth stays at Arizona. I think I think that's not unreasonable. He got heavily targeted last year. What did he finish as this year? He finished his tight end seven this year. Not all, obviously not all that with Arizona. He had some big games with Philadelphia as well. So, But clearly there were some weeks where he was very busy in Arizona, and I think it's not unreasonable to expect him to continue uh, playing a similar role going forward, assuming he remains there. He's an unrestricted free agent. <clears throat> All right, everybody. There you have it. Again, I would uh, like to remind you to go to footballdiehards.com. We've got content going up. John Lobb, 
starting his rookie previews. We've got quarterbacks, running backs, part one, wide receivers, part one. We have his initial mock draft, industry mock drafts, a group of great uh, industry professionals out there uh, chiming in. This is a super flex draft, his first one. It's a dynasty startup, basically. So <clears throat> that's worth checking out as well. A little bit of other content there, too, for you. And we'll be adding to it throughout the offseason, especially as free agency arises, constant flow of news, notes, and tidbits that'll kind of keep you up to speed. A lot of the stuff I talk about to start each of these conversations. I'll be back next week at noon Saturday to do the overall. In the meantime, if you're watching this live, you can catch me tonight on Sirius XM Fantasy 5 to 7. Uh, me and Mike Dempsey will be doing, continuing our divisional reviews, previews, review, overview things that we've been doing uh, tonight. Who do we have tonight? I have to look. Uh, there it is. I think it's the AFC West, NFC West. Anyway, we'll be doing a division tonight and a division Sunday night as well uh, from 5 to 7 as well. And, yes, I do plan on doing some best ball. We'll do some mock drafts here and maybe do some best ball type drafts uh, just for real on these on these uh, videos. And maybe do some special videos. You know, if people aren't really good for doing this on Saturday, maybe I can set up some evenings. And uh, Thank you, Valerie. I appreciate that. Yes, that's the goal, getting better. And we'll do some drafting on here. Uh, but check me out, Sirius, tonight and tomorrow night, Saturday and Sunday, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Monday night, uh, 10 to midnight, every Monday night. And uh, those shows are every Saturday. Catch me on Fantasy Dirt on occasion. If you miss the FSWA Awards, Fantasy Sports Writing Association Awards, I know not everyone's interested in that. But if you are, uh, catch the replay of that on Sirius. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, Mike Tagliere inducted into the Hall of Fame posthumously. Had his wife, Tab Tabby Tagliere, on. It was great. Uh, also, Scott Pianowski. Uh, David Ganos and Steve Gardner going into the Hall of Fame as well, giving out all the awards. So it was me, Evans, Funston, and Andy Barons. It was a really great time. So catch that on your app. And yes, Scott, we will get we will get some of you people involved. That's uh, that is the uh, plan to get the audience more involved. I think that makes this more interesting. The more involved you are, uh, and the less of me. Or dislike me if you want. It's okay. See you next week.